Mistakes Over Failure, where CEOs and board members from around the world share the good, the bad, and the ugly of their diversity and inclusion journeys. We are CEOs. We understand the pressures of leadership and the rules that are often unwritten. I'm Dr. Christine Crawford. And I'm Leslie Wingo. Together, we're here to spark honest and frank conversations that will encourage us to think differently, learn from failures, avoid inaction, and encourage each of us to make mistakes. The world needs better leaders, and we can become better together. Hey, Greg, tell us a little bit about yourself. You bet. Uh, my name is Greg Weaver. I'm executive vice president with Catellus Development. I've uh, been with the company for 23 years. Uh, started my career working in Denver on the Stapleton Airport redevelopment, which is now called Central Park, and then uh, relocated to Austin, Texas in 2002 to work on the Miller Airport redevelopment, and originally from Northern California. What emoji do you use most often? Oh, geez. Probably the laugh one with the tears in the eyes. What's your favorite book? Oh, favorite book. You know what? I have to be honest. I haven't read a book recently. I read so many documents. <laughs> I don't. It's going to be like an old book. Like, a, I don't, like a Mark Twain. I don't know. Like, I don't have a good favorite book. We, we could do Mark Twain. That's great. That's it. That's okay. my favorite book. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, my favorite art <laughs> author, really. <laughs> Perfect. What was your first job? Uh, my first job was a paperboy. Business acronyms. Do you love them or do you hate them? I probably hate them and use them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what is your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure is probably red wine, Pinot Noir, after work. It should be one glass and maybe turns into two or three glasses. It happens. It happens. Yeah. Oh, okay, maybe more. <laughs> Look at Leslie's <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> I resemble that remark. <laughs> As do I. <laughs> what is your favorite dessert? Oh, cheesecake, hands down. Which colleague or coworker has taught you the most? You know what? Um, our Catellus's former CEO, who just passed away two weeks ago, uh, Nelson sorry. Rising. No, he's an amazing man. He was 81 years old. He was an incredible man who, you know, from what I do, real estate development, like, and we could probably get into some conversation later, but was an incredible person who um, I give a lot of credit to what I do every day. What one thing I wish you would have started doing earlier in your life? Uh, why don't you know what? <laughs> it's reading more, and <laughs> believe it or not, because I do occasionally pick a book. I'm like, God, I wish I would have known this 20 years ago. <laughs> and the last question is What is the job you've always wanted, but you haven't done yet? This is going to sound silly. It's such a, uh, it's b being a um, snowplow driver. And <laughs> it sounds so weird, but I grew up for three years living in the mountains and I would see these people methodically like snow plying roads. And I used to, as a kid, I would go out late at night and shovel our driveway, pretend I'd put a flashlight on my head and I'd pretend I was a snowplow driver, which for no other reason, they just cleared the roads and it looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> so my first question for you is the foundation, the place that you've been de developing for the last two decades. Is it Miller or Mueller? I say Miller, but you can say Mueller. And uh, the city manager, Toby Futrell, who's been retired for many years, wagged her finger at me one day as I was being introduced as the project manager by the CEO, Nelson Rising, who I just mentioned. And I, I kept saying, I'm so excited to work on Mueller, Mueller this, Mueller that. And she was at the end of the table and she slammed her fist on the desk and looked at me and everybody in the conference room got quiet. And she said, son, in Austin, Texas, we call it Miller. And I looked at her and I said, <laughs> yes, ma'am, and never looked back. <laughs> well, it, what I love about working with you and the whole team on the foundation is that y'all have, and I, I was fortunate, I got to come in towards the end of it, but the community is incredible. It's transformational. Can you tell us about your involvement in coming into this whole project and how it's evolved and changed and grown to make whatever it was the reality of what it is now? Yeah, absolutely. And I've worked on it for about 21 years now. I was the first person with Catellus in Austin. I opened our office here in 2002. 
And I think the Catellus gets a lot of credit for the project, but the city and the community that predated us put a plan together. And so much of this vision and plan, whether it was affordable housing or economic development on the east side of town or sustainability, you could go on and on about it, was the community and the city's visions and goals for Miller that dates back to the 90s. Could tell us when we got on board in 2002, we were kind of the fortunate ones that got a great idea and a great concept with great goals and visions, and we got to be the ones to go execute on it. So I'd love to give the nod to the community who is a major stakeholder, a major part of this, but then also to the city that they joined arms hand in hand. They were kind of the two parties, and then we were kind of the third party that kind of created the third leg, you know, the third leg of the stool to make it all happen. So can you tell us a little bit about the neighborhood and what it has meant to Austin, kind of what it is now? Absolutely. Yeah. So the neighborhood, you really got to go back, you know, I mean, it's decades. It was a city's airport um, on 700 acres until the late 90s when the city built a brand new airport. And if you think of where airports are, they're noisy, there's traffic, it's industrial, there can be environmental spills, they're typically not nice parts of town, right? People don't want to live by them. And uh, just because there's a lot of different nuisance on a a big city airport. And then in Austin, Texas, east of I-35, there's a very sordid history that dates back over 100 years of segregation. And so you had this neighborhood and, and I say neighborhood, it was multiple neighborhoods east of I-35 that had some of the poorest neighborhoods. There was no grocery stores. There were some of the worst public schools, that, some of them that got threatened by the state uh, of closure. And the city looked at this airport opportunity in the community as a great opportunity to revitalize this larger neighborhood. And that was the beginning of the plan. And again, a lot of that predated Catellus, where this whole vision and this plan was to bring, there was a food desert, bring a grocery store. There was an employment desert, bring employment. There was a healthcare desert. There were no doctor's offices. There was no medical care. Bring all that, bring open space. There were no parks. I mean, it was uh, uh, shocking how few parks there were in this community. And out of the 700 acres, 140 acres is parks. So the transformation that happened of what it was for, for decades to now what's there is has been extraordinary. One of my favorite quotes is by a gentleman, and his name is Guy Kawasaki, and he's like, ideas are easy, implementation is hard. And there's a lot of complexity to this area and building and sustaining. So what are some of the things that you think you had to overcome to bring public-private partnerships together, business leaders together, organizations together to make this magic happen? Yeah, it's a great question. And it is hard. I don't, I don't discount that. I, I had a lot more hair when I, <laughs> I started this project. So, you know what? You know, one of the first things was, and, and, and this probably sounds a little bit corny, but it's trust. It is, our development agreement is a thousand pages long and you negotiate every, you know, every little detail on it. And you, you go out, you know, before we closed on the deal in 2004, we had over a hundred community meetings you know, small neighborhood meetings, large open houses, town hall type meetings. And it all feels good. But unless there's a trust where the community can trust us and we can trust the community and the same with the city. And again, all three parties, if you will, can trust each other. A lot of this won't happen because the the community and I'll use the affordable housing and the Miller Foundation you know, we in this development agreement, we had affordable housing goals and the community wanted more. It wasn't it w- wasn't enough housing. It wasn't affordable enough. And so at city council, when we're getting approved, uh, approved, I'm like, guys, we're going to try to do more. We're going to try to do more. And if I didn't have the trust, even of city council members who are big affordable housing advocates, they weren't going to approve the deal because they're like, oh, that's just a developer saying that. And then the deal gets done and they're going to move on and do the bare minimum. And so, so much of what's happened out there for years is this is this trust. Some of our fellow board members, one in particular, Jim Walker, he was a community advocate and an affordable housing advocate. 
And he and I, one of my first meetings when I moved to Austin, someone said, you need to sit down with him. And I was scared to death. I'm like, this is the enemy, like the neighborhood advocate, like he's the bad guy and I'm the bad guy developer. And it was the very first time we looked at each other and we sized each other up and we sat there and we walked away and we figured out we both grew up on the West Coast. We both had our oldest son, who's the exact same age. All of a sudden, we forget about the advocate and the developer we are so like-minded in so many ways from that very first deal. Well, that was the beginning of kind of building that trust. And, and today, Jim's, I consider Jim a friend. 20 years ago, the developer and the advocate were not going to be friends ever. It was going to be like button heads the entire time and we're friends. So to me, that is probably the linchpin that has made this, this is the like this thing that has made this incredible. So how do you maintain that trust, right? So you talk about the the kind of honeymoon period and the introductions and those conversations, but I'm sure things happen, things evolve. And so how do you get that trust to evolve with you? Well, I think as much transparency as you can, but you know your partner, I call him a partner now, the community, that I need to be able to have that trust in the relationship to be as transparent as possible. So I think he may try to convince me to do something different, but we could sit and kind of hash out like different things and trust each other to have the conversations. And then I always had a philosophy and I think people appreciate it. And I still have the philosophy. It's like, Hey, I'm going to share everything I can with you. And I'm going to be open book. I'm not going to hide anything or play games, but at the end of the day, we may have to agree to disagree. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to just say, no, we can't do this or no, we're going this way, you know, and just say no. And if I can tell you the why it is, I'm going to tell you why it is. And I was very, our PR team used to kick me under the table. Like yeah, I'd get my shins kicked all the time because <laughs> I was always known to talk a little too much, but it helped build the trust in the relationship that it was like, hey, that's if those people understand really why we can do something or why we can't do something when we're not just saying no, then th they're going to be like, okay, at least they're telling us up front. They're telling us what it is. And again, we may have to agree to disagree and that's okay. And so I think a lot of that over the years, you know, to kind of going, you know, it's been 21 years now that there's been a lot of this transparency and openness as much as we can. And then how do you maintain that trust when business leaders may change or government may change? I was trying to do the math in my head while you were talking. I think we've been through four or five presidents since you started this project. But yeah, how do you continue that thread throughout the project when so much, there's only so much you can control? It's really, really hard. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little luck. There's always luck in everything. There's a lady by the name of Pam Hefner at the city who's been in, who's worked on Miller from the late 90s. And she's been there from the get-go and she's the project manager today. So lucky to have her. And, and she and I built the trust. Lucky to have folks like a, a Jim Walker who's been there from the city side and from the community side. There's been, and there's others. There's probably a handful on each side that we've kept that kind of the team together and we've all built that trust together. And that's been hard, but I think early on, we all kind of got comfortable with each other and we probably tested each other a little bit and, and had to earn it. But I think we were all pretty leaning in, like, let's make this happen. I think the hard part, it's what you said there, and I haven't counted it, and I keep meaning to do it, how many mayors and city council members we've had. And I'm going to guess it's 40 city council members, five mayors, four city managers, you know, and our boss, our client is the city, is the government. And so dealing with the politics, dealing with changing and, and just educating people like every time there's new city manager or there's new mayor or there's new, you know, a, and when we did redistricting, you have to educate everybody again. And they start asking all these questions and they may have a different special interest than the previous city council. Our team spends a lot of time with outreach to continue to keep those relationships. And then this is a weird dynamic. We spent all this time, I mentioned 100 community meetings before we closed on the deal. And that was, there were 12 neighborhoods around that surrounded the old airport sites. So we had this coalition of neighborhoods. Well, then all of a sudden people started moving in. 
Well, the people that moved in probably didn't live in one of those 12 neighborhoods, right? And so why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And why is this that way? And that has evolved where now we have almost 13,000 residents that live at Miller. And so that's a whole different constituents that's evolved over time in addition to the neighborhoods, in addition to the communities of the surround, you know, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods and then the city. So it's one that our team spends a lot of time doing outreach and having a dialogue. So as I listen to you talk, there's a lot of things that that pop into my head for the CEOs that might be listening to this or the, the YPOers, the presidents of companies. And a lot of it is around sustainability, diversity, and affordability. What I love about Miller. Mueller, where you're from, <laughs> is that these things were thought of in the beginning. It wasn't something that was bolted on. It wasn't something that was thought after. It's something that continues to be part of what you do. So my question is, how do you make sure that that works for what you're creating? How do you get people who are not used to some doing something like this, how do you get them engaged? So I'm just curious, how do you bring people together around those ideas, more specifically business leaders, business owners, politicians, et cetera? Well, I'll tell you, so I'll tell you my story on almost all three of those. And there's so, so much more than just three, but in the, in the city's vision and the city plan that they created with the community, diversity was really important. Sustainability was important. Affordability, inclusivity, all of those were part of their plan, you know, and, and from a business standpoint, call it part of the business plan. You know, it was, it was really important that those were in this real estate development project, those were driven goals that every decision we go do, we kind of match up to those, you know, are we hitting those goals? Is this, is this fitting into that? So there's part of it just uh, planning and that was part of the plan. And then for us and for me, I'm going to use sustainability. For example, a lot of people have you heard of the U.S. Green Building Council today that's based in Washington, D.C., and you build these green buildings that are LEED certified. And in my industry, that is a very, everybody knows LEED buildings. Most developers have built LEED buildings. 20 years ago, there were a handful of LEED buildings in the state of Texas and maybe 20 LEED buildings in the state of Texas. And the city wanted us and the community wanted us to deed restrict all 700 acres that every building had to be green certified. And I was like the business person, you know, I, we're a for-profit company. I have to make money. People aren't doing this except for maybe governmental entities. I'm like, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Like, can I go do it? And what I ended up doing was lean, again, leaning into it. And I went to experts uh, using sustainability specifically. There was a, a predominant, there is a predominant expert in town. Her name's Gail Vittori. And she sat me down and she gave me the one on one on green building. And I was afraid, again, developer and is this an environmentalist who, you know, is going to chain themselves to trees and doesn't want us to go develop these things. And she sat down and said, you know what, you should go build all the buildings you want. And let me show you some techniques and some simple things to go do on the building. And so I think from a CEO standpoint or any business leader, like embrace it and educate yourself on it, kind of learn and understand what it means. And sometimes in diversity right now, you know, it's vulnerable. Like you got to stick yourself out there sometimes and get into some conversations. Our company, us individually are having conversations right now that rather than kind of go, oh, we don't want to have a conversation about it. We're going to go lean into it and we're going to take classes and do things. And so, you know, that's a big way. And that's a long answer, I think, for you, Leslie, but a, a long way of, you know, number one, have your kind of your visions, your goals, whether it's something you're created yourself or it's like, hey, you're, you're in a business, you're doing something that has these goals, your board of directors puts it on to you, whatever it is, and then learn. Don't just kind of veer away or get afraid of it. Go lean in and learn from it. And Miller was a learning example. The affordable housing, I had no clue what we were doing. Our company had done a lot in California and the community wanted us to do more. And uh, Francie Ferguson, our executive director of the Miller Foundation, she was my mentor. And I'm like, tell me everything. Tell me everything I need to know. And I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to go like commit to go do something that we can't go do. And so in all of these kind of lanes, if you will, all these different um, areas, 
I, I just leaned in. And so I think for everybody, it's like, hey, there's a lot to go learn out there and um, and find those mentors who can help you and who are the experts in those specific areas to help educate you and, and bring kind of real life examples of ways to whatever it is, execute on the business, do what you're trying to go do. We've talked a lot about trust and the community trusting you. How did you learn to trust those that you learned from, right? So there, there is something about your leadership that caused you to lean into what folks were telling you and to trust them. And so how did that work and how did you build that? Well, I think I just spent time with these people and it was just time over time. I think they started to trust me that I was listening and that I wasn't just showing up to check the box off to say, hey, oh, I went and met with a person who knows affordability or sustainability or diversity or whatever, that I, you know, I leaned in and I I really tried to learn, study and understand it. And so I think for them, although I couldn't agree to everything, like there were, there are things that, again, I, I, I had to agree to disagree, but I listened and I tried. Like if I could go do something, and again, this is what sometimes my team would kick me. It's like, gosh, you agreed to all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but that's why wouldn't we go do that? That's like simple to go do. And that starts building trust with the advocates, the people who are pushing things. It's like, why wouldn't we go do that? Yeah, it's a little extra work. It's a little here, but why wouldn't we go do it? I kind of look at Miller a bit of a a Petri dish, like a big experiment. And we tried things that had never been done before. And I kind of joke that if I, you know, there were a few things I probably went out on a limb that I didn't tell my boss at the time and agreed to go do. And luckily they worked out or I wouldn't be doing this podcast today. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's why we like calling this mistakes over failures. We're going to go big. And if we make it, that's a mistake. Great. And if we keep doing the same thing over and over, that's a that's a complete failure because we're expecting a different result doing the same thing. A hundred percent. I love Miller a lot. But one of the things that's always interesting, and Christine, I'm curious if you've had this experience. When I go into meetings and there's a question about diversity, usually it comes, people look at me in the room and expect me to know the answer. But with Miller, you walk into the room and the board is very comfortable talking about things about race and affordability and what that looks like. And it never came for me. And so it's always nice to be in their company where they're bringing up things that it's like, oh, yeah, they get a different view and a different perspective. I wonder, though, how did the board get there? Right. Because a lot of times governance and those structures they set the tone and they make it easy to have those conversations. And they also a lot of times have the accountability. And so how did the board always start out that way? Was there an evolution? Could you all share some thoughts on that? And I think both, both of you, Leslie, because you're on the board currently. One of the things that the board had to do, and this was before me, prior to me joining, was everybody opted into taking courageous conversations where, they, where we talk through Leadership Austin. It's a facilitated conversation with homework about how race shows up in the United States and more specifically in our communities and how we, you know, how we live. And so that work had already happened before I walked into the room. And then I, and I had happened to do courageous conversations prior to COVID, but that for some reason, there was an expectation that that was the norm to go through the class. And once that norm was met, having conversations around income and how that shows up and how things may not Things can't be fair, but they can be equitable. And how do we look at those things? How do we close wealth gap? It became a very productive conversation, not one that was set in fear and saying the wrong thing. At least that's how I felt. Greg, I don't know about you. You know, when you're building a brand new community with housing of all different types and you're bringing all these people together, you know, I'd love to say everything's rosy and great, but we had some issues. I mean, we had some issues that made national news, actually. It was on NPR and where a, a resident on Facebook, you know, they, there's a like a resident Facebook group and a resident goes, there's a black kid in the alley wearing a hood that looks suspicious. And the neighbor two doors down goes, that suspicious person is my son. And boom. And we're not on the Facebook, right? This is kind of residents only, but quickly we brought got brought into the conversation. And this is probably 10 years ago. And so, but we dive in because that's the last thing we want. Like it, it, it got so toxic. But what we also learned, and this was kind of watching the residents a little bit, take their own kind of issue. 
they convened their own public meetings. They had city council members and they had a dialogue. They had a tough discussion and it was these families in the discussions. It was other people. And we got involved in the discussion. And, and, and this was probably, I mean, that was one of those learning moments for me where it was like, oh gosh, I mean, everything, it looks as bad as it could be. And then it ends up being on NPR. You're like, oh, this is like from a PR, it's a train wreck. It's like, everything's bad. But the, in, in this NPR story was a two-part story. And the second part of it is, well, well, this utopia that went sideways came together as this community and had these tough conversations, but they're great conversations. And they, the outcome of what happened on this, you know, bad, unfortunate situation was something that this community still to this day gets together in these different groups and have these discussions. And so I think that wasn't so much the Miller Foundation as the nonprofit, but these board members and myself were all around it. You'd see it. And we we got into the dialogue of it. So I think some of it was kind of, we learned based on incidents like that. We learned because we took, you know, we educated ourselves, spent the time to do it. And it is, it's funny with Leslie, like I, we get in these dialogues again, kind of the family, and Leslie sits there and everyone else has a lot to say on diversity issues. And and then everyone kind of looks to Leslie because we're all like talking over each other and talk, getting excited about it. And then we look at Leslie, Leslie's like, oh, you guys got it covered <laughs> or, or not. She'll say, well, hold on, let me tell you the way it is. <laughs> So that's okay. First of all, that sounds like a dream. Let me just say that. Right. <laughs> and I live in a new urbanism community, actually. And I, I will tell you one of the things that I wonder is how do you continue to protect the things that you started out with? So just as an example, affordability, right? Because once you're successful, lots of people want to come in. So then that drives up demand, <laughs> that drives up pricing. And so as you become more successful when you do the right thing, which is what we want to encourage everybody to do, there is a cost to that. And so how do you then protect those kind of core values and tenets? Well, you're 100% right. I'd love to know where you live. <laughs> what new We can talk about that later. So Miller became super successful, super popular. And it was everything that was in vision was happening. It was in Austin, Texas. Real estate values went through the roof. We, we got a grocery store. We had restaurants, shops, parks, open space. Everything was like full till, which, you know, from a real estate standpoint, as good as it gets. But going back to the kind of the core tenets, affordability, diversity, we started running into problems. And, and not only just problems internally to the community, but going back to the 12 surrounding neighborhoods, we had gentrification, you know, which, you know, nobody wants to use that word. We had displacement. Th that was all a real thing. And I think through the evolution of the project, we just continue to change and change and change. And on the affordable homes for sale, there's a couple of things we did and evolved. We, we had a structure to try to retain the homes for the long term where the foundation has the right to buy the home back. And there was a formula when someone bought the house, there was a formula that essentially made the assumption, you know, that the price of the homes would go up 3% a year, you know, whatever the normal increase of homes would be. Well, in Austin, Texas, all of a sudden, the home values were going up 10, 15, 20% a year. I mean, it was, it was outrageous, incredible, like whatever you want to say. So we're like, there's no way our Miller Foundation is going to be able to buy back these homes because the values are going so high and then resell the homes to an affordable buyer. So what we did, we changed the program. And we essentially said that if you buy a house at Miller as an affordable homeowner, you only get 2% a year appreciation, irrespective if the market's going up like straight up, you're only getting 2% a year. And that house that you're buying, you know, call the house the market rate house may be $500,000, but you get to buy it for $200,000. So you get to live in this beautiful community, this great house at $200,000. It's probably, it may be your first time buying. So you establish credit, you make a little bit of equity. It's not the big equity, but you get your 2% appreciation. But that was a change that we made when we saw values going through the, through the roof at Miller. So another thing we did 
And this was probably some of the displacement and frankly, it's probably the African-American community um, in East Austin and the Hispanic community. There was a, in some of this might've been perception, some of them might've been reality. And some of this was Austin. There was a exodus of the African-American community in Austin and going to suburban communities to the North, to the South, to the East of Austin. And Everybody looked at Miller, you know, positively from, hey, it did this revitalization, but maybe it's causing some of this displacement, right? And so we actually started a program probably four or five years ago uh, called the Affirmative Marketing Plan that was a very pointed, directed marketing program going out to community uh, uh, halls, to churches, you know, going very direct to the community to make sure that we were actively, actively reaching out and not just relying on the marketing people and the salespeople that do their normal, hey, here's how we sell a home on the internet or however we go do it. It was being very pointed in the community that we were marketing the homes to. It's been a huge success. It took more work. It took more effort. But now all of a sudden we're seeing um, on the affordable homes and in the market rate homes on everything, we're just seeing the population, the diverse population uh, of everybody uh, growing significantly at Miller, but that was a very active approach. You know, going back to your question on this new urbanist community, no one knew that these house values would go up so much. Nobody knew that this displacement would be so significant. But once all of a sudden the alarm bell started going off, we started putting plans into place and changing the plan to help offset it. My last question is, you're almost done with this project. What are you most proud of? And it's been 20 years, 21. You know what? It's all of it. Leslie, that's a great question. It is, you know what? And I I go back to the three-legged stool and I, I go back to the individuals that we as the individuals and kind of the institutions of the community, the city and the developer, we're still hand in hand. And it is something that, And there's been a lot of adversity, there's been downturns, there's been issues, and it is still the the three of us, kind of these three institutions can still sit there, have a beer, laugh about stories, and this thing's been a crazy, crazy success. Like it is, it's hard to compare to, uh, for me, career-wise, this is like one of those uh, probably once-in-a-lifetime opportunities to go work on this from soup to nuts and everybody's still hand in hand on it right now. And I could point to all, I could point to a whole bunch of things that have gone out there and and, and the design of it and the affordable housing and everything else. But this is, we we weaved around and, and been ups and downs and everything else. And everybody's still together hand in hand. And it's one, it's the community, it's the city, it's us, all of us. Again, and this is, I mean, kind of sounds corny, but it goes to this trust that that trust was established 20 years ago, that trust is still there today and things still pop up today. And I, it's what I also worry about. I worry about is something going to go wrong. I, I literally like things are too good and I'm knocking on wood right now because it's like, I don't want to like, like say this and then something goes wrong, but we're all still hand in hand on this. And uh, I wanted to, I want to, you know, kind of put a bow around it and it's like celebrated. And the project officially ends at the end of next year in December of 2024. And I can't wait for like the celebration of this is done. And this is this is a whole bunch of people, you know, probably hundreds and hundreds of people who are a part of it. So anyways, that's what to me is I'm most proud of all this. Well, Greg, I want to thank you because I think you've taught us and all of our listeners so much about, I think, commitment and adversity and leaning into adversity and I think the evolution and the maintaining of trust. So want to thank you so much for uh, hanging out with Leslie and I. <laughs> well, thank you. It's great hanging out with you two. Let's do it again. You bet. Thanks, Greg. We'll take you up on that offer. Thank you for listening. We are Mistakes Over Failures, a podcast by YPO the global leadership community of extraordinary chief executives.